Good evening, everybody, and welcome to an edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Mad Mouth, and I tell you, we have ourselves a great crew tonight, and I am really excited about this show tonight. Give you an idea, we're bringing in Jack Percante, who played for the Los Angeles Dodgers, the Chicago White Sox, Seattle Mariners, and at that time, the Cleveland Indians. And with us tonight, uh, Jack, we want to welcome you. We got Rick, Mr. Opinion Curdy. We have Lou Landers and, of course, Eric Katz, who's known for his concrete dump. Shame on you for not putting it on your bio, but that's okay. Uh, everybody, will, he knows what his identity is. And first of all, Jack, we want to thank you very much for joining us here on the Sports Exchange. Uh, thanks for having me on, Scott, and uh, looking forward to it. And, uh, yeah, and nothing better than talking baseball and sports. So glad to be here. Well, you know, I got to tell you, Jack, the first time I had ever heard about you was at the 1981 baseball winter meetings at the Diplomat Hotel in Hollywood, Florida. I happened to be eating lunch with Al Campanis. I happened to be eating with Tommy Lasorda and Steve Brenner, the PR guy. I heard that you were traded, okay, to the Cleveland Indians with Rick Sutcliffe in exchange for Jorge Orta, Larry White, and Jack Fimpel. So... You know, let's talk about your Dodgers career a little bit and then your thoughts about when the trade occurred. Well, my Dodger career was mostly AAA baseball, you know, because I was stuck behind Davey Lopes for a number of years. And then um, when they were finally ready, Davey got hurt a little and they were ready to make a move. They kind of jumped over me and took Steve Sachs up. And so the writing was definitely on the wall that I wouldn't be a Dodger for too long. But my time there it was basically two months Uh the end of uh, 1980 and the end of 1981. And even though they were just two months, they were so exciting to be part of the Dodgers. And, you know, they're always were very good at the time. And the 80 team, we were in a uh, right down to the wire with the uh, Astros. And I played in a few of those games. And then uh, 81, of course, was the year they went on and won the World Series. And it was it was a strange year in 81 because of the strike, you know, so. Uh, we had a loaded Albuquerque AAA team, but none of us had anywhere to go because, uh, you know, of the strike. So we just uh, all were down there. There was no moves going up or down. So, but anyway, my Dodger time was just wonderful. And I was fortunate to get a World Series trophy and ring out of it from 81. And uh, I couldn't ask for anything more. Yeah, let's talk about that World Series ring. I know when we talked about it last week that the Dodgers were really classy enough to give you that ring, even though you were there for a short period of time. Why don't you tell us the story behind the classy way for how they handled it and everything that went along with it? Well, yeah, you just never know, you know, what uh, I, I think the players in that vote on shares, you know, how much people get. And then uh, I don't know who decides on rings and trophies, but yeah, it was just you know, when that, when those uh, arrived in the mail, it was just a, a dream come true, you know, and <laughs> excuse me, there's players that much more accomplished than me, never got a World Series ring, obviously. And so for me to have one, it doesn't always seem fair, but um, uh, it's, it's uh, one of my great memories, I guess. So tell me about the highlight of your career. Well, I would say on a personal basis, there was two of them with the Dodgers. Those games I mentioned, we had three games to play against the Astros um, with uh, we had to win all three in order to force a one game playoff in 1980. And uh, I played in all those games. And in the uh, I believe it was the Saturday game of the week, uh, we were I was in at second base and the Astros had runners on first and third and two outs in the ninth inning, you know, and I'm out there praying the ball doesn't get hit my way, but it it was, and I made the play. And so that's, you know, I would have been a goat forever if I didn't make it, but I made the play. So I felt great. And it was very routine, but under the circumstances, I always felt it was uh, the best play I ever made. And then in 1984, when I was with the Mariners on a, once again, on a personal basis, uh, I tied the Mariner record on the last day of the season for hits at the time, which was 180, and uh, my 180th hit was off uh, the great Tom Seaver. So that, on a personal basis, that was 
just incredible. Uh, you know, earlier, guys, we talked about Carl Yastrzemski a little bit, and uh, I actually caught the last ball that he ever hit in a big league game uh, when I was with the Indians. I caught a pop-up. So it's kind of a good trivia question I always ask people. But So that, those, I guess, are my three personal highlights. You know, there's a lot of team highlights, I guess, but on a personal basis, that's those three. Well, didn't you say you got a hit off of Roger Clemens as well? Well, I did. Yeah, that was cool. But like I say, it was before we really knew he was going to be one of the greatest of all time. Okay. So I, he still threw very hard and I got a double off him. But uh, I've gone back in the records and looked it up to make sure I was right. And uh, it, it's there. So, I, yeah, I feel really good about that. Oh, well, why not? If you get a hit off of Roger Clemens, no matter when you get it, at least it's something you can talk about to people like myself and the rest of my crew for sure. I mean, hey, how many people can say they hit Roger Clemens in the big leagues, whenever the case may be? And we're not going where most people want to think we're going to go there. So, all right, so let's talk about what you've done off the field, because one of the things I really like to do when I bring on new guests here, it's not only what you accomplished on the field, but it's what you've done as well. I know that before we get to that, you were traded. Believe it or not, the baseball winter meetings always seem to be an interesting time for you because I know on December 7th, 1983, by the way, my mother's birthday is born on 70, December 7th, but not 83. She was born on the bombing of Pearl Harbor, but no, Mom, it's okay. But you were traded with the Cleveland Indians uh, with Gorman Thomas to the Seattle Mariners for exchange for Tony Bernazard. What's so interesting about your trades is who you went with. One minute you go with Rick Sutcliffe, and then the next you go with Gorman Thomas. So if they're going to include you, at least they put you in a halfway decent package anyways. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, I was just a throw in on both, but, uh, you know, they were such great players and uh, good friends at the time. So it's just cool to know you're going somewhere and you already know somebody, you know, in the clubhouse that was a teammate before. So that's always comforting, you know, so – but yeah, I was just a throw in guy on those, but it, it felt good at the time to be moving on because my careers uh, were kind of stuck at the time in both places. Well, it's a good trivia question, nevertheless. So, all right, as I mentioned moments ago, the one of the things I always like to do when I bring on new guests is not only what you did on the field, but what you've done off of it. And I'll, and let's talk about the books that you've written. You wrote a book on creating a season to remember now. Uh, I, uh, now out, I believe. Is that correct? And then, uh, which is now out, excuse me, creating a season to remember, which is now out. Then you have another one, The Making of a Hitter and Raising an Athlete. So you, those were published in 2009. Then you have another one, uh, Baseball, the magazine. Talk to me about each and every one of those books. Well, the, my first one was The Making of a Hitter, and that was uh, kind of – you know, information I gained from teaching hitting to kids for all the years after I uh, got out of the game. And so I thought it was a way of, uh, uh, you know, putting, helping kids. Uh, unfortunately, times have changed on how we teach hitting now. You know, it's it's not put the ball in play anymore and hit ground balls and line drives through the infield. You know, it's more drive the ball. So the book is kind of out of date as far as what it taught. But at the time, it was very helpful, I think, to a lot of people and did well. Um, my next book was Raising an Athlete. And I, I kind of realized that um, being around kids and their parents for so long, a lot of parents really didn't know how to go about uh, helping their kids to advance, you know, and in a lot of a lot of ways, they are uh, uh, impediment to their kids' careers, you know. So I thought I could put in uh, writing what I had learned on raising my own kids and then helping kids in their careers. So I wrote that book. And then uh, later I realized coaches, uh, a lot of them, you know, they mean so well, but they had no training and didn't know how to go about helping, uh, uh, helping kids and teams and dealing with kids, you know, and dealing with their parents too, which has become a big issue. So I wrote creating a season to remember. And then my last book is actually a, a marathon running book that just came out the last six months and it's called the, the success trail. And it's, uh, it's a book about, I've written, I've run 15 marathons now. And, uh, it's just kind of a fun look at, uh, running. And when, once again, the things I've learned on how to, uh, 
I kind of incorporated how I made the major leagues along with how I finished marathons and kind of put those into a book and to help athletes once again to maybe, uh, you know, have the mental strength to persevere and get through the hardships of, uh, you know, their careers and for me now running, you know, so I still run marathons and it, it was helpful to kind of put it all down on, on paper. You know, what amazes me when I look at the title of each book and I'll break them down a little bit, creating a season to remember is neat in its own right. When you think about it, the making of a hitter, of course, nowadays, like you say, everything changes and then raising an athlete. Then uh, you had baseball, the magazine, you, uh, I believe you were a writer there. Is that correct? Correct. So yeah. Obviously you have some exceptional writing skills and then you talk about the book. So when you put a lot of those skills into writing, you know, what is it that you, type of gratification do you get out of it? Not only writing for baseball, the magazine, but your books as well. Well, once again, I, I tell everybody, if you feel like you have knowledge that maybe other people don't have, then you should write it down and pass it on, you know? And so I would, I just self publish my own books. So I don't go out trying to, you know, get publishers and that. I just feel like I know things that maybe others haven't from all my experience and not to sound, uh, you know, cocky or anything. But once again, I feel like I know things that others haven't. And so it's worth writing. And I, I really enjoy writing when I write. Uh, my mind really obviously goes to work. And uh, I think it's fascinating how, you know, you can say the same thing in five or six or 10 different ways. And so to try to figure out the best way to say things is a lot of fun for me. And so that's part of it too, you know, and uh, it, it just, once again, I just, I, I uh, sold my own business about 15 years ago and I realized I had a brain and that's when I started write, uh, writing and uh, it's it's just something I enjoy doing. And that business that I have in front of me, the Jack Percante Sports Academy, I believe you ran that from January of 88 to October of 2006. I, that was like 18 years, 10 months. So you know, you talk about baseball and softball school. Tell me, did you take a lot of pride in running that academy? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, I, I tell everybody I, I found something after my career that I enjoyed more than playing baseball, and that was working with kids. And so that's that's been really the love of my life. And so to be able to do that and do it in an academy the way I wanted to do it, uh, it was uh, just so enjoyable. Uh, it just got to the point where it was just overwhelming. And so I felt like I had to uh, get away from it and just, I still teach, but I just do it on a smaller basis and just go in and, you know, rent, rent facilities out instead of having my own. Well, at the end of the show, we're going to give you an opportunity to let people know how they can get a hold of your books. One thing I want to get into, too, that I'm going to turn it over to Lou, okay? And that's a universal designated hitter. The uh, collective bargaining agreement is now complete. The National League has it. The American League has had it. Did you like the way uh, – did you like – do you like the universal designated hitter? I mean, personally, I always like when the pitcher hit, but I realize the time has come, and obviously you, know, you, you do have it. Yeah, I've always been for it myself. I, I never enjoyed watching pitchers hit. And uh, it's, you know, I know it takes away a little bit of the managing part of it, but then um, I like seeing the best pitchers stay in the games too and uh, the best hitters be up there batting. And uh, so I, I've always been for it. It gives more jobs to big league hitters and keeps them around longer, a lot of the stars and that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Yeah, Don Manningly told me on Sunday when I was covering the Marlins against the Astros up in Roger Dean uh, Chevrolet Stadium that he's a guy, obviously, you know, being a New York Yankee, had no trouble acclimating to it because he played with the Yankees. So, therefore, it was an easy adaptation. I knew Lant I know my pal Lou Landers is chomping at the bit. So, Lou, why don't you take it away? Obviously, uh, there's a lot of different things about the game of baseball that we certainly want to bring Jack into, and of course, Rick Curdy and Eric Katz are patiently waiting to uh, provide their input on these as well. Go ahead, Lou. Well, one of the things Jack hit on was opening up jobs for other players, which I agree with. I would also say that um, extending the career of players is definitely up there. Just look at Albert Pujols, for instance, just signed back with the Cardinals where it all started for him. He doesn't get a job 
if there's no universal DH. He's a perfect platoon option. They brought in Corey Dickerson earlier in the offseason. Perfect platoon situation there. Nelson Cruz into his 40s, still mashing the baseball. And that's a guy that's basically been a DH for a decade now, plus uh, deficiencies in the outfield, but great with the bat. So that's something to consider. And then, of course, the obvious with there being maybe five pitchers who are adequate hitters, the rest of them not so much. And with all the money and Invested in players nowadays. Um, I don't want my thirty million dollar pitcher going up there and tweaking a muscle, getting hit by a pitch, whatever it might be, and then losing them for a amount of time. And then how about if they happen to get on base, which does happen the odd time, running the bases? Um, it, it's not something I want to take a risk at, especially when you can pay a hitter to specifically do it. Uh, some teams in the American League are more in the fact that they have one particular player for the spot. Um, they've started to kind of have a rotating door in the American League. I think in the National League, that's going to be the case a lot more. Guys who are maybe 33, 34 and up are going to get a couple days off a week, not from the game, but from being on their feet for nine innings and get to kind of play. The Dodgers are a great example of one with Justin Turner, who's a great bat. He's getting up there in age. A way to keep him fresh would be to throw him in DH spot couple times a week whatever it might be that's just one example but i think it's overall best for the game especially with all the interleague play we have now with 15 teams in each league for so long there was 16 in the nl with the astros and 14 in the american league now with there always being at least one interleague series these teams should be playing under the same rules yeah i couldn't couldn't agree more with everything you said lou let me incorporate something in the chat that uh, mark pricer mentioned that the nl uh, DH should have happened 10 years ago, and that's how far behind MLB is. So do you, any of you guys want to comment on that? Well, I'm I'm, I'm going to go in the opposite way, and uh, I'm not a fan of the DH. I've always been a more of a National League fan. I like seeing the pitchers hit. You know, my, my thing is if you're on the field, uh, you should bat. You know, and I love seeing people like Greg Mannix and the John Smoltz. There's some good hitting pitchers out there, and a lot of athletic pitchers there, and I've just never been a big fan of the DH. I understand what Lou's saying that they can get injured running the bases. I mean, they can get injured, you know, a line drive to the head if, you know, uh, a guy uh, hits the ball fast. So, I mean, injuries happen, you know, it can happen around the bases. It can, I mean, people get injured. It just happens. But um, I knew it was coming. I'm not a, not surprised by it. So um, I, I never really got too upset about because I knew it was coming eventually the universal D eight. So, but I'm fine with it because I, I, I knew eventually that it will come. Rick, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do the research. Cause I don't think you're going to be able to do it off the top of your head. I'd be very impressed if you could <laughs> find me 10 pitchers in the last 20 years who are career, even 245 hitters and up because I don't think you'll find it. Probably not. I mean, uh, I, I just that's Matt, the point. You Maddox mentioned Maddox was a and great Smoltz. hitter. Smoltz was a yeah. great hitter. Glavin, Bob Force were great hitters. You know, Degrom, Madison Bumgarner, Granky. Those guys aren't bad from you know current days, but they're not lighting the world on fire. I mean, it's it's it was so much easier to navigate an NL lineup with the pitcher there. The eight hitter barely saw anything to hit, and it was honestly almost an automatic out. Yeah. And, well, and it, I think it shouldn't be. I think the other thing is like, uh, you know, pitchers are a lot of great pitchers. You got to pull them in the fourth, fifth, sixth inning because their team is down a few runs, but they got to get back in the game. And, you know, it's. Uh, How about Fernando? He was so good. The Dodgers use him as a pinch hitter sometimes. Yeah, Fernando, Fernando Mania. Did, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And you know what? You might still see that with certain pitchers nowadays uh just yeah. to save a bench spot if you want to mm-hmm. you want right. to save a bench spot or a bench bat or something certain pitchers will go up there and take some hacks it's possible i um you know in regards to dh it should it should have happened as soon as ron bloomberg stepped up to the plate <laughs> I, it's i just think that you know yes there are some pitchers who are very who are very good at hitting i will i will give i will give you that but I mean, all right, injuries happen, but I'd rather them get hurt doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is, which is pick up ball, throw ball over the plate, and hope and hope some guy doesn't take it to the third deck. I just think that it should have happened as soon as Ron Bloomberg stepped up to that stepped up to the plate, and I just think that you know if I if my pitcher is going to get hurt, I'd rather him doing it doing what he's what he's supposed to be doing, 
not doing uh, doing situations he could easily avoid. Well, I remember, I think it was A.J. Burnett a few years ago, maybe even five years ago now with the Pirates. Uh, he got hurt in spring training, batting practice, practicing bunting. And he missed three months because he was he wasn't he wasn't even in a game. It was batting practice, them trying to bunt. I mean, that that can't happen when you have all this money and stuff well, invested into these pitchers. AJ well, there wasn't a whole lot of money there because AJ Burnett was like through at that point in his career. So, you know, the the uh, uh, yeah, you want to get yeah, I yeah, think the Yankees were paying him to be on the Pirates, but well, it was, yeah. it, was, it was before it was before that too. I think when they um yeah, they gave him to the Pirates, and I the Yankee the Yankees were paying part of that contract because his arm just gave out. But you know, as far as that goes, there wasn't a whole ton of money invested there. Essentially, the Pirates were getting him for free, and you know, he was through at that point in his career. I think arguably, when he got traded to Philadelphia, he was done even even upon arrival. Yeah, and I remember uh, Chen Ming Wong. I don't know if you guys remember him. I do. Um, he was a great pitcher for a few years. I think back to back 18 or 19 game winner and then interleague play. He's rounding third base, completely messed up. He had an Achilles or something like that. Guy was never the same. Um, you know, career pretty much down the drain because he was rounding the bases. Something right. he never had to do in the American League. I just think that, you know, that you have, you know, you have situations that can be avoided, you know, especially hitting, running the base, whatever. If he's going to get hurt, fine. If he throws his arm out, fine. You know, that's that's just what the job entails. But if I can if I can avoid having him pick up a bat and with the with the potential of some 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 guy who's more wild than Nuklelouch, then I'll then I'm willing to then I'm mm -hmm. willing to um then I'm willing to take my chances there. Well, and I think the rules should just be the same for both leagues, whatever they are. So to have two different you know sets of rules just. Doesn't yeah. make sense for the top level of any. Or, or having American League umpires and National League umpires. I'm glad they got rid of that because, you know, some, um, you know, especially like in an All Star game or World Series, it could, it could be real, very tricky. So I'm glad they got rid of that as well. Right. I mean, they're at, they're all the same. At the end of the day, they're going to call balls and strikes. But you'd rather, you'd rather not have a whole fan vote at the end of the year. At least social media didn't exist back then. Of which umpire, which umpires are worse? Uh, Joe West, besides Country Joe, I'd probably say Angel Hernandez is the worst. Oh God! Oh yeah. Angel umpires Hernandez. do tend to have completely different strike zones, though. I mean, there really is a thing called pitchers umpires and hitters umpires. Yeah, which the which in that in that case, you know, if the pitchers are smart, they learn they figure out what the which I don't know if they receive scouting reports or not on this, but they figure do. Out yeah, just figure – although the strike zones are never consistent, though, as far as I've seen. No, but some guys will get that high pitch above the belt. Some guys will get that pitch just below the knees. Some umpires call more east-west. Some call more north-south. Some have a smaller um, strike zone. I mean, so I do a lot of fantasy baseball content, and that's something that sometimes is overlooked uh, when you're playing in the fantasy game and you have a pitcher with a pitcher's umpire that night you want him in your lineup versus when there's a hitter's umpire. Um, those are just small things to consider, but um, I, that's why I know one of the topics Scott you wanted to talk about potentially was automated strike zone. And for a long time um, I was so against it, but because of what I'm just talking about with so many different strike zones every single night from different umpires, maybe there should be an automated strike zone so that it, that it is the same game to game pitcher to pitcher umpire to umpire. I think um, I think an automated strike zone would be great for the game. I mean, you know, you just have kind of one one specific thing. It's no longer a judgment call. It's um, it doesn't become a situation where you know if, it, if it's just one zone, then got you know you you'll see less ejections, and you know and pitchers and batters won't complain. It's a fair between fair and unfair because obviously um you can't please both both parties. Yeah, in fact, we got another comment from Mark Pricer. That's one of the things that we're going to address anyways, but I'll get it out there ahead of time. And that's the next thing about banning the shift. So with that said, Jack, what are your thoughts about banning the shift? Um, I think baseball needs to make changes, and if that's the one they feel that will help the game, then go for it. I, I, I don't know that much about it. I mean, I've always been the type that, you know, used the whole field and – 
you know, adjusted to the defense as a hitter trying to control where you're trying to hit the ball, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And if, if it helps the game, I think it's worth a try. So I'm not against it. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Lou probably would know the analytics a lot more than me, but I think if it, it helps uh, the game in general to be more watchable, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pull-heavy hitters, and there's people who take the approach of, well, they're professional hitters. They should be able to hit the ball where it's pitched. And, Jack, you would actually be able to speak to this more, being uh, an instructor and going up through the minor leagues. Are they teaching that? Do they try to teach take the ball where it's hit or are, do they kind of let guys do their natural thing and stand in there? If they're pull heavy, let them be pull heavy. Um, I believe all kids or most kids are taught to use the field and handle the bat, but I believe, uh, you know, the money is with the home runs now, so it doesn't pay to be a spray hitter and hit 310, but five home runs when you can hit 25 home runs and get paid millions of dollars. So, so I think the agents and everybody has realized that the money's with the home run. So even though kids at a younger age learn to use the whole field, I think when they get stronger and get into professional ball, even college, it's, it's all about the home runs to get, get paid. And so I think it's drift, drifted in that regard. So like you say, a lot of these guys could go out and hit the ball the other way, but if it's going to produce a single, they don't want it. You know, they want the chance to hit the home runs and get the big power numbers. And so everything's based on that nowadays. So I would say, you know, like I say, if the shift getting rid of it helps the game to be a little more watchable and, um, well, everybody is so obsessed with the home run for sure. I agree with that. And there's a lot to, kind of comes into it with regards to if you are more offensive friendly or if you like the pitcher's duel. I mean, I love a pitcher's duel one nothing into the eighth inning starters, both in the game. The problem with that is it barely exists anymore because pitchers, if they go five innings, it's a pretty good start. Bullpens have kind of taken over now. Uh, so many big arms coming out of the bullpen. Uh, the analytics say second time through the order is enough for a pitcher. The third time through, they get hit harder. So they go to the bullpen. So at this point, I want to see offense and second and third, two out, bottom of the eighth big time at bat uh ball drilled up the middle a clean base hit up the middle wasn't happening anymore because of the shift they were just playing the second baseman or shortstop right behind the second base bag it becomes a routine ground ball i miss those days of that clutch seeing i single through the uh five six hole let's say or whatever it might be uh so for me i'm i'm good with them banning the shift yeah i, I agree with you i think that the problem is you know the the home runs and the swings that guys uh, put out to get them, you know, you're going 15, 18 minutes sometimes without a ball ever being put in play, you know, and I think that's the issue that makes it unwatchable is there's just no action, you know, and so we got to figure out a way where, um, you know, so much time doesn't go by and there's not one ball in play and there's, you know, walks, strikeouts or home runs and that's the whole game, you know, and so, Pitcher duels are great, but not if there's never, like you say, never balls going through the infield or contact, and it, that that gets tough to watch, I believe. Yeah, or the uh, swinging bunt down the third baseline where there's no third baseman because <laughs> of the shift. Right. I mean, I mean, sure it happens, but uh, another thing is with these with these hitters and the shift and everyone is taking it so literal, literal banning the shift. They're not banning shifting. They're banning having three guys on one side of the infield. I mean, growing up playing baseball, there was a lefty up as a shortstop. I would slide over much closer to second base. I just wouldn't be on the right side of the infield. So they're not banning people from shifting. They're just banning people from being three or four people on one side and basically having four outfielders against lefties per se. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's they're not just moving on that side. Like you say, they're halfway in the outfield, too, for guys that can't run. So it's like six outfielders. So, that yeah, I think in that regard, getting rid of it would be a good thing. Hey, you know, the only time six outfielders would be any good anyways, if you had to play a game at the L.A. Coliseum like they did many years ago. 
when the Dodgers first moved there. I couldn't help it since, you know, we talked a little bit about L.A. We talked about the Coliseum. Coliseum just recently had a NASCAR race, so they've used that building for just about everything on the planet. And once upon a time, the Dodgers did move there before they went to Chavez. Right. Uh -huh. So, yeah, you had players, all, all, all those rules go off the table when you're talking about the L.A. Coliseum. So we have our man, Mike Pricer. He's really into this, Lou. I'm telling you, he's matching with hands with you. We almost feel like we have a six guest here with Mike Price. I used to do shows with Mark Price, or similar to these, actually. He's a oh, very he really? guy, big football guy. Um, going to be drafting, helping him draft a baseball team on Thursday night. Hopefully, I didn't let the cat out of the bag, Mark, that you have a uh, a ghost runner, per se, um, <laughs> on, on the field for you. I'll, I'll be uh, helping him out Thursday night. Oh, well, we got five co-hosts, but you might as well add Mark is basically the sixth. Continue on, Lou. I know we've covered a lot of ground, but I know we have a lot more to go. Keep it go keep it rolling. Well, Rick and Eric have been kind of quiet here the past few minutes, <laughs> so I'm going to turn something over to them. Um, Rick, the larger bases coming into play, do you have any thoughts on that? Why do it? What the purpose is? Feelings one way or the other? No idea. I think it's stupid. I think banning the shift is stupid. I think, how can he get rid of strategy for goodness sakes? I mean, we're making the, we're watering this game down so much. These guys are professional hitters. I mean, they used the shift on Ted Williams. He hit 406. Okay. How can he get rid of strategy like that? I mean, what's next? Are they going to make switch hitters bat left-handed because it's an unfair advantage to the pitcher? I mean, it's it's gone silly. I understand you got to make the game better. You got to make the game faster and all that. But doing stuff like that is not going to help the game. You want to know what's going to bring fans back? Lower the cost of food at the concession stands. Lower price tickets. Lower parking because the game has gotten so expensive. That's why people are not going. But getting rid of like putting extra large bases, banning the shift, that's not going to help the game. It's it's to me, it's just watering it down. And I want to see a 2-1 game. I don't want to see uh, Aaron Judge or or Stan, you know, striking out 190 times a year, hitting 210 with 45 home runs. I mean, that that's just not baseball to me. So, I mean, doing all this stuff just because it's the home runs and all this stuff, to me it's kind of silly. But the extra bases, I just think that's probably one of the most dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, I don't know the exact reason behind it, and I usually know the answer to almost everything, so it's a little surprising. But I think the idea is for safety purposes, guys sliding in yeah. hard to bases, uh, more room for them to kind of slide around. A, a I remember when they would like uh, when it'd be a close play at first, and sometimes uh, the I seen uh, like a runner like sprain his ankle because he was trying to get the tippy toe of the of the base. So I think. That might be the logic to it, but, I mean, they've never said why they're doing it. They just say, we're going to make the bases larger, and it's like, okay, but why? And if they just came out and said, that's why we're doing it, then good, I'm okay with it. But just say why you're doing it instead of just, like, this ghost runner thing. I mean, I feel like I'm watching a horror movie. I mean, that's that's another silly thing they're doing. There's some things I do like what they're doing, um, but banning the shift, extra large bases, ghost runners – um, and I can tell you something about the automatic strike zones. The Atlantic League of Professional Baseball has been experimenting with stuff like that, and I've seen a game with it, and it's not good because the computer cannot tell a ball and a strike. And, you know, uh, we've been talking about robot umpires, you know, and other shows. And what it is is that it's not going to be like a robot umpire. It's the computer. And what it is is that the, uh, uh, the umpire has like a, an earpiece, and so he's getting – told that the computer called it a strike. So you're going to see a delayed reaction. Those things are on the ground. It's a strike. I've seen high high strikes. I've seen low strikes. That's not going to help the game at all. you you, you got to put the human element in the game. And to me, they're just putting too much um, computers and technology into it. And to me, that's just that's not baseball. No, if they're gonna do it, it has to be mastered. It has to be perfect. Yeah. It can't be. It can't be balls in the dirt being called strikes. I yeah. agree with you, Eric. Your thoughts on the big bases? Are, is it just me, or am I thinking um, of softball where they have that little orange base at first base? They have the white one and the orange one. Is that what they're doing? Or 
I think they're just trying they're they're trying to add more action to the game by having more runners on. But to me, I don't think it'll make a difference because it because at the same time though, you want to give they're trying to give it advantage. So they're trying to kind of go the route of kind of football where the rules favor the offense more. But I um, you know I I really don't see it. I think it's you know I, I still think though I mean essentially a defense is going to have an easier even easier time put when the ball is hit to them like on a bang bang play they'll have an easier time putting their foot down the bag rather than falling off the bag or 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 stepping in the wrong place where eventually where eventually they uh, could come down with an injury I just um I don't see it again this is I I'm not sure who I'm not sure who's worse of, a worse of a commissioner than in baseball Bowie Kuhn or 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 Rob Clanfred, Clownfred, excuse me. Scott, back to you. Oh, I'm not commenting on the commissioner one. So if you want to, I don't know, Jack. Are you into the old commissioner stuff? You you had to deal with Bowie Kuhn back in the day, and I personally like Peter Ubrah because anybody that could go ahead and turn a profit with the Olympics isn't bad in my opinion. So. I don't know. Do you want do you want to dive into that territory at all? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about any of them, so <laughs> I don't. All right, so let's talk, let's talk about some of the other things that come to mind. And, and first and foremost, okay, being a traditionalist, the pitch clock has been talked about where you have 14 seconds with no runners on, 19 seconds with runners on. Jack, to me, is that uh, a theory that's come of age that we can get used to doing this? Because I know they've experimented with the minor leagues. Yeah, I think all these things they're experimenting with and trying to figure out what's going to help. You know, like I say, I just deal with kids mostly and kids don't watch the game, you know. And so if we can figure out ways to get them back watching games, I think I'm all for it. So to think of anything that might help, um, to make it more exciting and get kids watching again, I'm all for it. And, you know, they have world series games go on and they get over at midnight and, you know, kids saw the first two innings and went to bed. I mean, things like that. Um, you know, I like, I like for the game to be grown and I don't see where it's going to be grown if we don't do something about what the way it's going and make it more watchable. And so, you know, I don't know the answers. I haven't, I don't know any of the research on. Jack, have you ever asked any of the kids why they don't watch the games? Is it too it, boring, too, too boring, too boring, too long, too boring, not too enough boring, action? Too long. Yeah, absolutely. It's always been too boring. They don't even watch World Series games anymore, you know, um, which is kind of sad, you know. And I'll ask kids all the time, who's in it? Um, you know, and they, a few know, but if their parents told them, but. You know, and I just think that's a shame. I'd like to see it, you know. Uh, Look, I played a lot of baseball growing up, but most of what I learned was watching the games, watching them from first pitch to the end, even if they were five and a half or six hours. Absolutely. And then one of the guys mentioned earlier, just the cost of everything to a game, you know, so to take a family is an arm and a leg sometimes. And so that's not really great either. So hopefully they can do something to... Get it's much in, cheaper to pay $129 for MLB TV. Yeah, exactly. For a whole season. <laughs> Definitely yeah. is. Uh, one other thing, Scott, that I know we wanted to talk about um, with the pitch clock itself was if it will actually necessarily speed up the game. Right. And it probably should, but at the same time, how will it affect these pitchers? Pitchers are so routine-oriented, and them having to maybe rush to throw a pitch – uh, maybe signals get crossed up a little bit. I think this is going to affect pitchers a lot compared to a hitter who, where they step out of the box, adjust their gloves, whatever it might be for five, 10 seconds. I don't think it's a big deal, but for these pitchers, it could be a big deal at first. I think at first is the key word there because I think they'll adapt. And, you know, if you get it going in the minor leagues, then by the time they get to the big leagues, they're used to it. So I think you probably got to incorporate it there first, just get a, you know, get it into the minors so that by the time guys get to the majors, they're used to it and it's not that big a change. But yeah, I'm sure many of them right now, if you threw that on them, guys that's a 10 year vet, that would be really tough, you know? So, but I think you got to incorporate it over time and then it'll become more standard and uh, doable. I've actually seen it. Um, 
Uh, the Charlotte Knights, um, you know, I've actually seen the game with a pitch clock. And at first it's kind of unusual, but act, but you actually kind of forget about it. And does it speed the game up? Honestly, not really. But all I got to say is a uh, good thing pitchers like Steve Traxel are uh, retired. Remember, remember the human rain delay that take like uh, an hour to just, I mean, it was, he was, uh, my goodness, or Nomar Garcia Parra with his, uh, with his adjusting his uh, his batting gloves and all that, I know those days are gone. But Paul Canerco did that too. Yeah, or Canerco. So I mean, um, the pitch clock, you know, you get used to it, and you kind of just don't see it there. But does it make the speed of the game up? Maybe a minute or so. But it, to me, honestly, it, it's it's um, doesn't really do do much. Jack. So, Jack- Jack, I want to go back to the ghost runner, the automated runner on second. I was hoping when they had that collective bargaining agreement, they could get rid of that thing. I've watched that thing. I personally detest it really <laughs> a lot. I don't know why. I really do. And now all of a sudden the players and the owners like it. Jeez, folks, my goodness, you negotiated to get rid of it, and all of a sudden you got cold feet. So I'm talking to a former MLB player here, Jack Percante, okay? Give us – your opinion on the ghost runner. I mean, you've only written on this stuff all over the place. You have taught it. Is a ghost runner really legit or get rid of it? Yeah, that's the one I would get rid of. I've never liked it. And, you know, there might've been a reason for it there with the shortened season, but um, yeah, I don't think that's real baseball at all. That's yeah. That's one I, that I don't agree with changing. And um, yeah, so I would get rid of it for sure. Yeah, and then as we lead on to what the pandemic did, we saw the one thing that the pandemic did, COVID-19, it forced us to do a lot of things. Therefore, leading my next point about the seven-inning doubleheaders, I'm glad that we don't have any of those. So, Lou, I know you're nodding your head about the seven-inning doubleheaders. Why don't you go ahead and give us your opinion on the seven-inning double doubleheaders? Everybody else can do it. And, of course, we want Jack. His opinion is extremely important as well. Well, first of all, the I do want to hit on the ghost runner. It's sure. definitely not baseball. I mean, extra innings is supposed to be exciting. It's not supposed to just end. You know, you're not trying to just get rid of the game and have it end. I mean, a, a hit to the right side and a sacrifice fly and you score a run or a wild pitch. And like you shouldn't be able to win a game without a hit, basically, um, is the, the biggest thing there. And then with regards to uh, – sorry, what did you ask me? This is the second thing, the seven-inning doubleheaders. So it's, it, 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 it's too much. Nine innings is a baseball game. Seven innings is not a baseball game. And trying to jam in extra games to do it like that just kind of takes away from the game that we know and we love. Uh, for me, it's 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 all about nine inning games. And if they go to extra innings, great. Let's not try and shorten the games. Um, I understand trying to speed up the game, but that doesn't necessarily mean shortening it based on what it's been for over 100 years. I I agree. I agree totally with Lou and you, Scott, that, uh, yeah, we don't need seven inning games and, uh, the, uh, hopefully the DH, you know, may help that because now you don't have to run through so many pitchers and they can extend a little further. So there's no reason for the seven innings anyway, you know, if you can keep your pitcher in games longer because of the DH and at least in the national. So, uh, hopefully that all help that too. So, but yeah, I don't like seven inning games either. Well, if you're going to go there. You might as well just devalue the no hitter because I wouldn't classify a seven inning no hitter as an actual no hitter. I know that was a conversation Rick Curdy and Eric Katz that was brought up as well. I mean, a no hitter to me has always been a one guy getting it. I don't even like combined no hitters, Jack. Okay, to me, a no hitter is done by one individual for the duration of nine plus innings combined as well as seven inning no hitters. All right, guys, let's have a little round table, okay, of uh, the seven inning slash no hitters. Who wants to take a crack at this first? Uh, Since baseball here is around the horn, okay, Eric, you're volunteering with your hand. I think that, you know, I I thought I could understand some of the rules we had in play at the time, though, with – the ghost runner and also the seven inning just because of the pandemic and the situation we were in at the time, because we didn't know what we didn't know about the, about this, about this virus. But now I, I think, I think the ghost runner is a joke. I think seven inning is not a legit baseball game and seven innings. All right. That's basically when 
you know, that's two less innings a team has to potentially make a comeback. Say it's four or three in the seventh inning. By the time you get to the stretch, that's when, you know, that's when pitchers tend to start to kind of, at least the great pitchers anyway, start to kind of feel it a little bit in the arm and they start to get a little, a little tired. And that's when, you know, they, that's when other teams start thinking about the bullpen, but seven inning, no hitter. I, I think that's not legit. You know, you're basically, the pitcher basically has a shortened game. So say a guy like, a guy like Garrett Cole or Walker Bueller, that's like, that's a walk in the park to them. But yeah, seven inning no hitters. I just like they did with with uh, Ro- with Roger Maris's home run. I, I put an asterisk on it. Lou, well said by Eric. I mean, you look at uh, you look. I think it was Madison Bumgarner, if I'm not mistaken, last year yeah. with the seven inning no hitter. And there's two ways of thought. I mean, it's not a full game, but at the same time, he wasn't even given the chance to pitch the full game. Maybe he gets those final six outs and gets the no hitter. So it's, it's unfair to him, but at the same time, those last three outs are the hardest to get. So he never had to go through those last three outs in the ninth inning when you're wearing down. Uh, I, I, all these changes, all these rule changes, and this is going back to the DH to extra playoff rounds. I mean, all the playoff records, have been broken over the last 20 plus years since there was wild cards. And now guys are playing way more playoff games. Um, they're getting more playoff hits and more playoff home runs. Things change with rules. Um, they just need to be sure to make it known that this happened under different rules, like an asterisk, as, as Eric pointed out, um, like Roger Maris's home run. They went from 156 games to 162 games. Those are things that do make a, a, a big difference. Uh, playoff wins, playoff saves, playoff home runs, they've all gone up because there's at least three extra games, if not five extra games, and now there's going to be even more with an added playoff team. So the game is changing, and everyone's going to have to adapt. I mean, with the with the records and stuff that you know get set now, especially with you know it's you know you, you know not so much now with baseball, but I think we see it now with with football. I, I don't know how you because you know it makes me wonder, man, what would he would have done with an extra two games? I mean, he could very well do nothing at all, and so be it, fine. But we'll never know. It was like when Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle were going after the home run record in 61. You know, get, Babe Ruth played in about 154 games at that point. But, you know, 60-plus home runs, I'm, you're just thinking, man, Ruth might have been able to hit 75. But no, knowing Ruth, it, had he had those extra games? But we'll never know. I just think that – I just think seven innings is just not legit. You know, it's – you know, this isn't college you know, where they have a seven inning game on Sunday. Um, but it's, you know, the pitcher has a shortened game, you know, that that's two less innings. He has to throw that, you know, we've seen it all the time, you know, in a nine inning game is, is a full, is a full game. Imagine a seven inning game where some of these big old comebacks that happen in, in the ninth inning, a big rally happens. We'll never get to see that. If, if, if they put up a if during that game they put up a goose egg during the seventh inning, right now one thing I can only one of my favorite movies was Back to the Future. Okay, <laughs> but since we have a guy who played Back in the Past, Jack Fricante, on the broadcast, okay, why don't we talk about pitch counts and lack of complete games? Because I know Jack, you didn't have to really deal with any of them. There were nobody was worried about a pitch count. Nobody was worried about, you know, had a lot of complete games. Do you feel that those two things in this day and age, Jack, are vastly missing? You know, I've always been a firm believer that a pitcher should be able to go nine, especially if you've gone every four or five games and and it takes the pressure off the bullpen that you have to wear them out. But, you know, this is a traditionalist question here, Jack, and I don't think there's any more, but a more equipped to answer that pitch counts to me seem high at 120, but back then 180 to 200 was the norm. And of course you had a lot of complete games. So do both of those things hurt the game of baseball? Um, I think you want to see your stars on the field as much as you can. So if your pitchers are the star, I want to see them in the game, you know, not coming out after 80 pitches. <laughs> 
<coughs> excuse me, after 80, 90 pitches. But um, once again, all the research being done, I'm assuming they know more than the traditionalists know, you know, and there's a reason why they're taking these guys out because of numbers. I mean, yeah, there was the greats back in the day that could do it and were, you know, you're, but for every Nolan Ryan, there might've been 10 other guys whose careers got shortened because they burned them out from pitching too much. And I, I see it in high school, you know, I see kids, you know, they, they're throwing 120 pitches in high school the first day of the season, you know, and it's like, I don't, I don't see how that can be right. So I think we got to find a balance with everything. And, um, but yeah, like I say, I like seeing the stars stay in the game. That's for sure. But um, so it's a difficult question. I, I'm not sure, you, you know, what the right answer is. Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Go ahead, Lou. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I agree that stars should be the game, but because of the way the game has changed, there's star relievers now. Uh, there's big name relievers that come in that people are excited to see. I also believe that guys are just throwing significantly harder. 91, 92 was big time gas, even in the early 90s. Um, if a guy throws 91 or 92 now, he gets knocked um, in the media and by scouts. Oh, he doesn't have enough gas in, in his arm. So that's something to consider. When guys are throwing that hard, it does more wear and tear. Um, medical um, advancements have shown what the damage is done to these arms. Uh, so to protect players, keep them healthy, keep them around all season, keep them ready for deep playoff runs. That's the the goal. And analytics tell you, I think we talked about it probably about 20, 30 minutes ago. Analytics tell you that even the best starting pitchers struggle a lot more the third or fourth time through a lineup. So the idea is go to someone fresh out of the pen, comes in, throws 95 to 100 with some sort of nasty breaking ball, and they get more outs. They get more strikeouts. And you can see some of the best relievers nowadays throw 80 to 90 innings because some of the top starters might max out at 180 or 185. I think last season there was only 10 pitchers who threw 200 innings. Uh, I believe 40 years ago it would have been five times that. Yeah, I think uh, you make good points. I, I think there's obviously star relievers, but they're usually at the very back end. And teams go through these sixth, seventh, eighth guys or fifth, sixth, seventh guys. Year after year, there's a big turnover because they burn those guys out after a year or two in the big leagues. So, you know, it's there's some good and bad with uh, relievers too. You know, they're they're like you said, they're taught to throw 95, 98, 100 miles an hour go in there, throw as hard as you can for two innings and they get two year careers and then they're done, you know? So it, it, there's, once again, they got to figure out things, I think, on, uh, on all that stuff. Well, that well, also well, ties back in the seven inning double headers. When we had them, the biggest point for a good team to kind of rally back would be post starting pitcher before you get to the back end bullpen guys in the seven inning game, you might get five and a third from your starter or even six innings, then you just get to go right to your beast at the back end. There's not really as much room for mistake. It kind of rewards the teams that aren't as deep in their bullpen and sure. in their pitching staffs. For and sure. I don't think that's right either because the whole idea is it's, this is a team game and you, if you can just go, it's not a video game where you pitch your ace and then you go to your best reliever and stamina doesn't matter. It's real life. And being able to go from Garrett Cole to a Chapman or Jacob DeGrom to Edwin Diaz or Walker Bueller to Blake Trine and whatever it might be, um, Corbin Burns to Josh Hader, there needs to be something in between and the teams that have that depth and have great bullpens are missing out on, on um, taking advantage of that. And the teams that don't have great bullpens um, kind of were getting an advantage there. So, well, you know, it's funny, Lou, you say a mouthful there and I'm really glad you did. I want to go back to one point about Billy Martin used to go through a lot of pitchers because he did believe in complete games. And I think he'd probably have a hard time managing in this era because of the specialization. That's number one point. I want to get out another thing. And I'm glad you said what you did, Lou, because then all of a sudden you got guys like Josh Hader who can go two innings, but then he can't pitch for a day or two. Where back in the day, Jack, you were used to the Raleigh fingers of the world that could go two or three. No big deal. You know, so 
there, there's no question the errors certainly play a lot into philosophical ways that the game is done. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. Things have changed and got to adapt with them, I guess. I think um, part of it, too, is back in the day, starting wise, you started the game and you completed the game. If you only got lifted, if the batters were lifting your pitches, that that's like that's how it went. And it used to be too. We'd rarely have a star reliever, maybe a closer like Sparky Lyle or Goose Gossage. But now nowadays, you know, everybody's got a everybody has a star closer. I mean, I'd probably say Mo christened it like Marano Rivera christened it with being the super with being the superstar closer I think he was like the first of his kind at the time Trevor Hoffman was ahead yeah. of him but Hoffman didn't have the playoff success wasn't in the same big market but you're right, right. Um, oh I'm not guys... well, I'm not taking a dig at I'm not dig, taking a dig at Hoff because I really sure. liked Hoff it was just you know in, Mo obviously pitched in a much bigger market in New York City Hoffman's Hoffman teams most of the time, except for maybe a couple seasons, and, and I think also the World Series year where they where they went in '98, they were his teams were never were were never that good. His also his teams were never never consistent at all. Absolutely, but the thing now is even the teams that don't have a star closer, they have two or three really good pitchers who all compete for those jobs. Like the Rays, um, and they can be interchangeable. Seattle has four guys. The Rays, you mentioned, definitely. Um, the Dodgers have a guy like Blake Trinan, and now they're talking about how they might use Trinan in key situations in the seventh or eighth inning, bring him in seventh inning, bases loaded, two outs to get that big out instead of as a closer uh, because the bullpens really control the game now. Um, if you have a good bullpen, you have a chance to win because even if you're down a run or two going into the middle innings and the late innings, your bullpen shuts the door. You can scratch a run or two across and take that W. Well, it used to be the um, – it used to be, I think, I think Jack during his, I think Jack can probably attest to it during his era. You wanted to get to the bullpen. And, you know, you knock that, you knock that superstar out of the bull game. Well, now you can go to the, now you don't want the bullpen because the guy throws 95 plus two and he's, and he's probably going to be in for a longer career. Cause what does he do? Throw what every other game? Yeah, you're right. Uh, and you don't see those guys as often. So there it's, you might face, you know, three or four different pitchers every game and they're all got, Crazy good stuff. So yeah, I wouldn't want to. The one thing Major League Baseball. Sorry, Jack. I was okay. just gonna say the one thing that Major League Baseball has done uh, to at least try to control the advantage of the bullpen is the three batter rule. Uh, you know, there's not lefty specialists anymore because uh, they don't come in. They can't just face a lefty um, unless it's the final out of the inning, right? They have to face at least a couple batters. So that has at least kind of made it so that relievers, it's not as easy anymore just to come in, face that one hitter and be done, uh, especially the lefties. Um, so that's something to consider. They have made some rules to kind of, um, I guess, address issues that might have come from the way the game has changed. Well, you know, it's funny, Lou, how you bring that up. Okay. And thanks for bringing it up. I really appreciate <laughs> it because we talk about extended reliever and I think Jack could attest to this, right? The three batter rule to me kind of makes you think about the, uh, pit, you know, the two or three inning reliever that you're forced to do something that you really have to do over an extended period of time instead of get that one out. So I'm, you know, and again, now if we really want to drive ourselves until, uh, the year 2023, we could talk about the other rule changes, but we're not going to get too crazy. But uh, I know I have a Mr. Opinion who's uh, absorbing a lot. But when you talk about openers, okay, it, uh, which I really hate the idea of openers. Jack, did you ever think that you could ever see openers start a game and knowing that you can go five, six, seven deep? I saw a bunch of them at the Miami Marlins game. I'm thinking, holy moly. Uh, how do you breed relievers out on the farm? This is just unheard of. Rick, uh, w w give me your – but then I want to really hear from Jack on this. Well, I mean, I think the problem with the pitching is that they all want to throw 100 miles an hour. It's like the like the base, like the the hitters. They all want to hit the 500-foot home run out of the ballpark, you know. But to me, it's, it's still one home run. These pitchers all want to throw 100, 102 miles an hour. Like, oh, wow, look, he threw 101 miles. I could care less, you know. Bring me the days of Greg Maddox. You know, with the 
you know, where you had intelligent pitching, where you use your head instead of like how fast you can throw. And uh, that that's what I miss. And the analytics to me is just, you know, I mean, it's just, it's too much analytics. And, you know, there's, I have no problem with it, but when you use it a lot, like, a, you know, like a Kevin Cash did. And to me, analytics cost the, the Tampa Bay Rays a World Series, in my opinion. So um, no, nothing wrong with it. But when you base it entirely on that and you have all these pitches that want to throw fast, you know, to me, again, that's not baseball to me at all. So, um, but having all, I miss Dennis Seckersley. You know, to me, he was one of the best closers I ever saw. Control, he was in there, bang, bang, 12 pitches, you're gone. That's the kind of stuff I miss. Now you see I'm going two, three innings, pitchers going four or five innings. They're just, you know, it's just, it's all about, you know, how fat, how hard can I throw? And and they just re really need to uh, teach the, the pitchers that it's not all about fastballs. You know, if you want to have a long career, I mean, look at uh, Tim Wakefield with the, with the knuckleballs. So it's to me, it's, it's like hitting the 500-foot home run. Everybody wants to throw 102 miles an hour. I think – Baseball has become, you know, with with pitchers and batters, what it's all or nothing. So home run. I mean, I miss the days of when a guy like Jamie Moore, not a devastating fastball, but Love man, him. but man, his off his off he pitched well into his forties. You know, he but man, his off speed stuff, especially his changeup, was just absolutely devastating. I love Jamie Moyer. I mean, yeah, like Moyer, Greg Maddox. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just so many pitchers out there like that. And now you don't see that anymore. They all want to throw 102 miles an hour and, you know, all this stuff. And it's just, it's, it's taking the, the magic out of the game and, you know, um, the analytics and all that, you know, it's fine and all, but when you put it entirely on it and use too much science and, and not, not using your, your intelligence or your gut feelings, I hate it seeing managers, especially Dave Roberts, take out pitchers during a seventh inning because uh, of a no hitter because, oh, he's throwing too much. Let the guy fit, throw the no hitter. I don't care how many pitches he throws, let him throw the no. You don't take pitchers out because they're they're in the middle of a no hitter because they're going they're they they went past their their pitch count. I mean that's 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 silly. So I mean uh, let them finish the game, see what happens, and uh, you know. But uh, these pitchers today, they all want to throw 102 miles an hour, and nobody wants to be a great Maddox. Also, uh, also don't for, don't forget though, has analytics won a World Series? Keep that in mind. Yeah, or Moneyball. Has Moneyball ever won a World Series? And Moneyball, I'm sorry, is never going to win a World Series. That's why Major League Baseball needs a salary cap. I mean, the Red Sox may have you may have has said to use Billy Bean strategies. Well, it also helped that they had a, a roided up David Ortiz, a man, and a Manny Ramirez in their lineup, and also and money to spend. Yep. Yeah, you can play Moneyball. With you money, and money, it's going to make you better. Um, analytics, the game is definitely analytic driven at this point, and I don't blame anybody for that because everyone's looking for an edge, everyone is trying to win, everyone's trying to find every little edge that they can possibly get. Um, for me, one of the things you brought up, Scott, was the opener. I have no issue with the opener because, from an analytic standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. You have one of your top pitchers start the game go through the one through five one through six hitters then bring in a pitcher who faces seven eight nine faces the one through six one time and i can face seven eight nine again and you're basically through more than half the game already uh so it, it, it there is advantages to it there's also strategy to it you start uh, an opener that's a lefty well a team might stack righties and then the guy that follows him is right-handed the guy that follows him is right-handed and then suddenly you have all the matchups you want so there's a lot more to it than just the simple oh there's an opener he's only throwing one inning or five batters whatever it might be all right so here's what i want to do jack you, you've everybody you've heard what everybody's had to say about these things why don't you give me your comments on this? And then I have three direct questions I want to get your opinion on. And I know we want to wrap it up uh, pretty soon. Okay. So knowing that I've talked about openers, you know, the three batter minimum and all the different changes, you know, again, you played the game uh, back in the eighties and you've been around it for a long time. Why don't you try to do the best you can, Jack, assess each and every point that we, because I know, obviously, you've done an incredible job absorbing everything that's been thrown your way. And I know the Olympics are past, but in my opinion, Jack, 
you deserve a gold medal. I can't give you one, but I can definitely get you dinner in Illinois. So go <laughs> ahead and try to uh, make a lot of sense of what all of us are throwing your way. I'm sure you probably enjoy all the camaraderie, hearing it from a lot of different places anyway. So, yeah, yeah I, I agree with the guys. I mean, you guys probably are bigger fans than me nowadays, but um, I don't think the opener will ever take off completely because of agents, you know, and wanting their starting pitchers to be starters. And, you know, I don't think you're going to go to a Max Scherzer and say, Max, we're going to start you in the second inning and not start the game. So I think the stars are still going to be your starters and uh, that'll be the main portion of the game. So I don't think it ever become huge, but once again, if it helps you win some games and you're not starting your stars, then, you know, I think it's good strategy if it helps them win. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And, it's good. The three player, three batter minimum, I think, like you say, I think it was uh, kind of inevitable because it was getting ridiculous that a manager's going out, you know, three, four times every inning and for one guy to throw one pitch and then the next guy come in, throw another pitch, you know. And so I think it did did the game good to, to be able to do that. So, um, so, yeah, like I say, with everything, I just hope we're – heading in the right direction and they're using their best judgment. Uh, analytics, you know, I think we're all kind of, you know, overwhelmed and sick of it and all the numbers they throw out there. Sometimes I, all the stats, I have no idea what a lot of them mean, but um, once again, I hope we nope. find a, a Nobody balance. will win a world series with analytics. Go, go tell Kevin Cash that. You know, well, he cost, think, his analytics cost him the uh, Tampa Bay Rays a World Series. I, yeah. I don't know if you can blame Kevin Cash for that, though. All the guy was, was on a roll. I know, but they, all they he were did, touch, Rick. The Dodgers were not touching him. He I understand. Was, and, then, but, and the next season, he got traded because he was so disgusted. He said, I'm out of here. Trade me. And they traded yeah. him. You could, say the, you could say the Braves won an analytics. You know, they were getting those relievers, those lefty relievers in as early as they could in games on those. So... I mean, all Kevin Cash did, win. though, was what he had done all season to get them to where they got. All he did was was do whatever he had done to get them there. Um, you can't expect him. You can't blame him for doing what he had done all season. I understand. And in hindsight now, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and say, oh, he cost them the World Series. But I thought his I was decision like, what is what he got doing? Them there. This guy's on a roll. You don't take out your hottest pitcher. You know, during the World Series, because a computer or a statue tells me if they hit him, you know, again in the lineup, they're going to, they were not going to touch him. He was on a roll. And you just don't do that. So I was like, what is he doing? That was my reaction when I saw that. Yeah. And that's, that's an old school approach. And that's, I mean, how I grew up. I would never want to see my, my top guy go out. But looking at it from the standpoint of Cash just did what he'd been doing all season, I understand the move. And Snell, the real reason behind Snell being traded is nothing to do with that. It's all to do with the fact that he was entering arbitration years and the Rays are cheap. So the Rays capitalized on what they could get. They brought in younger players who are more controllable where they're not spending big time money. And that's what the Rays do with everybody. That's why Austin Meadows is on the block right now. That's why Margot is on the block right now. That's why they signed Wander Franco now where they could pay him way below what he's going to be worth in four or five years. Um, that's, that's the Rays way. And they're, I, they're doing it well. well. They're competitive every year. Yeah. And hindsight is always 2020 20 anyway. So it's, so, Jack, let's, go, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about Jack, okay, the way the game is being played today versus when you played it. Do you like the way the game was being played when you played or do you like it today? Pretty straightforward question. Um, that's easy for me because I'm a, you know, I'm a bunt, steal your, steal a base, contact, put the ball in play, uh, hit and run, you know. So I was that was my game. So to not see any of those as part of the game really hurts me. So I don't. I don't like that. Uh, and like I say, I don't like seeing all the strikeouts. I have I have trouble watching games a lot of times because I just don't see anything going on. And so that, that hurts, you know, because baseball has been my life. And so I'd rather go out and watch the kids play where there's more action, you know, and things like that. But hopefully, like I say, I'm not going to give up on it. I hope we find ways to to make everything better, I think you know, as hitters start to see the 95s and 98s more often, I, I think they'll learn to 
hopefully adjust to that better. You know, I think that's happening a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's a process, but yeah, I don't, I don't enjoy seeing the game the way it's played now. No. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you a combined question. And one thing I want to make sure I get in here before we, uh, Call, call it a night as I enjoy watching Frank Tanana reinvent himself in a flamethrower to a finesse pitcher. I think that was one of the things that was important. I don't know if you see that nowadays, but I'm going to combine this question, Jack. First of all, when you look at the way the game is being taught, are these players are ready to actually get to the big leagues or do you feel a lot of the, first of all, do you feel these guys are being taught right? And then are, the second part of the question is, are these players ready to get to the big leagues? Well, you know, I think college has done a pretty good job of, you know, helping kids uh, learn the game more. But, yeah, fundamentally, there's just no way they can be as good as I think when we played in the sense that, you know, I spent five years in the minor leagues. And so I feel like I was probably learning the fundamentals and how to play the game maybe a little better than some of the guys that are rushed up there. But once again, the money kind of rules everything and you're you put a lot of money into these kids. You want to get them up there as soon as you can. And um, so it, it's, I would say fundamentally, they're probably not quite as sound, but not to take anything away from the big leaguers. I think in time, they, they're just learning on the, on the job more at the big league level than back in my day, we learned at the minor league level. So after a few years, you know, hopefully the guys, uh, you know, that don't just get a cup of coffee and last a while, then they, they play the game fundamentally uh, really well, you know. So, but it's just, a, it's a different game. Getting back to your last question, without without a hit and run, without a bunt, without steals, they don't need to learn all that stuff. They just need to uh, learn how to hit the ball over the fence, I guess. So in that regard, it's changed. So right, one other comment in the chat room that good old Lou's buddy, Mark Pricer mentions here, about the ghost runner. I know I'm going to wrap this up really shortly, though. He said he's good with ghost runners after 11 innings. I kind of agree with it, at least after 11. And they're talking about 96 to 100 is becoming the uh, standard for all pitching. So, you know, and it's just as easy to touch a young prospect to throw harder than smarter. I like to mention these because it's interesting when I talk to a baseball person like yourself, Jack, how a lot of these things come into play. I mean, all you guys, let me tell you tonight, brought a lot to the table, and I'm really, really delighted – with all the various opinions that we were able to get on the sports exchange. Just so you know, folks, the sports exchange can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, or subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And it can be on, seen on www.southfordatribune.com. With that said, as, as time comes to an end, first of all, Jack, I want to let everybody, uh, you to let everybody know how they can go ahead and purchase your books. I think that's important for you. And then everybody else have an opportunity to uh, mention where they can get a hold of them as well. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And it was a pleasure and a lot of fun. And uh, the time really flew. I was <laughs> didn't know it would go this fast, so that's great. Um, <laughs> you know, my books, you can get them on Amazon. That's probably the easiest thing. So I would just refer everybody to Amazon. If they want to read more, I have a, a blog I put out every week uh, at jackperconti.com that some people uh, might enjoy. It's, it's uh, trying to figure out what, how, how people are successful, you know, the road to success. And that's kind of what the blog is about, trying to figure out, you know, how we get through life and get through sports. And so that would be on my website, uh, jackperconti.com. So. So, Jack, have you ever been on a show where you had this many different opinions from so many different characters? Because Lou Landers, to me, if you ever get into fantasy baseball, he's going to have a chance to say it in a little bit. This guy, we have a guy that, uh, Mr. Opinion, who will say whatever the heck he wants. <laughs> Eric Cass is I'm a traditionalist. Guy. Well, that's it. He is. Uh, he knows a lot more than me. See, I, I, he's definitely an unnatural broadcaster, Rick Curdy, but that's beside the point. Okay, Eric Cass is that kind of guy in the middle, and Lou Landers, to me – it knows a lot about fantasy and knows a ton of stuff. And I hear I'm tooting these guys, but have you ever been on a show with so many different personalities that do so many different things? Um, yeah, I probably have at one point, but it's just fun, you know, to hear different views and it's not like anybody's right or wrong, right? We just all have different opinions. And I think we all want to see baseball keep growing and uh, be better in the future than it has been. So I think we all have the same intentions, just maybe different ways of 
going about it. Great perspective. All right, Mr. Uh, Pinion, why don't you give everybody uh, quickly how they can get a hold of you? Uh, my website is www.charlottebats.com. You, uh, my email address is cltbatsbaseball at gmail.com for any uh, questions or comments you want to leave. I'm also on Facebook at uh, Charlotte MLB, and I'm also on there at Charlotte Bats Baseball. I'm on Instagram at Charlotte Bats. I'm on Twitter at Charlotte Bats Baseball. And I'm also on LinkedIn, Rick Curti, C U R T I. And uh, you can contact me anytime um, on those social media websites. And Jack, if you didn't figure it out by now, with uh, Rick Curdy, he wants Major League Baseball in Charlotte, just to give you the uh, thumb. Uh, Charlotte and Nashville, they're coming. Right, there you go. There All right, go. Eric. Eric Katz uh, is a no-no because he should have put concrete dump on there earlier. <laughs> just we need to find Olympic Stadium. I'll give him a brief, and then we're going to save Lou uh, for last. Well, I'll, you know, last. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll let me explain that, that that reference to Jack. It was in reference to the Montreal Expos um, Stadium up until they moved to Washington. I got you. <laughs> yep. Um, you up? You can find me on Twitter at Sports Team News. I write for BellyUpSports.com covering Wisconsin Badgers football. All right. Well, Lou Landers, the, he's the man here that uh, has uh, – I love when Lou tells me that he knows more uh, after the 80s, okay, than anybody else. And then I bring on a guest here like Jack who's so uh, been into it for a lot of years. But all right, Lou, take it away. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Landers Talks. You can find me on Facebook, Lou Landers. Uh, I do the Counting Stats podcast, the Lucas Baseball podcast. Once the regular season begins for daily fantasy sports players, I have Lou's Locks podcast. You can find me on Sports Byline USA Armed Forces Network and every Sunday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern on the Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Channel. So I guess the biggest understatement that Lou just said is he's busy. And the guy finds time to work with me and give me a little bit of information. All right, just give you an overview of real, us real quick before we call it a night. As I mentioned before, you can hear the uh, audio version of this broadcast on Spreaker, Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcast. You can subscribe to the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel. You can find it there. You can find it at www.southfloridatribune.com. And, yes, we have a Twitter account. So there you go, Jack. And FYI, when you go on Twitter, you can find us at Tribune South. And you can email us at southfloridatribune at gmail.com. Well, all I can tell you, it's been an absolutely wonderful show. I couldn't be more blessed to have five outstanding individuals talking about the great American pastime. I know we covered a lot of different things, and I think you guys are hanging in there with us. And more importantly out there, Mark Pricer, thanks for being on here a lot. And for all you folks that watch and listen in to this show, because you know what? Without you, it's not fun because we're here to aim, to entertain and inform. And I hope we accomplish that objective that tonight. So. Meanwhile, on behalf of Jack Percante, Rick Curdy, Eric Katz, Lou Landers at Landers Talks, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange. And Jack, we hope you join us uh, down the road. But meanwhile, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you very much, Jack. Appreciate you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Jack. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. Coming on. Pleasure was all mine. <laughs>